Hey, I'm Lisa S. Johnson, photographer and author of Immortal Axes, Guitars That Rock. I'm at LSJ Rock Photos, and I'm watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today on a musical journey of sorts, looking at the history of rock, not only rock and roll, but also rock guitars. And we're joined today by a very talented author and photographer who has perused the rock scene for, for many years and in looking at her work, it is truly an incredible journey. I was stoked about looking at the photos, but now we get to talk with her face-to-face. -face. We're joined today by the ever-talented Lisa S. Johnson, creator of Mortal Axes Guitars That Rock. How are you doing today? Hey, Kurt. I'm doing great. So fun to chat with you this morning. Thanks for having me on. Oh, it's a pleasure having you on. And, and looking at the journey that you've gone through as a photographer is truly an amazing experience. But I want to ask this question first off. What was the first live concert you went to that inspired your photography? Well, the first rock concert I ever went to was Kiss. Oh. My first album that I ever bought was Kiss Hotter Than Hell. And that was my first concert. The, I was 12. My second one was Alice Cooper in the same summer. And then uh, the next one after that was ACDC. And after that concert, I was just ruined forever when it comes to rock and roll. I was indoctrinated all the way. But one that inspired my photography, I would have to be honest, uh, going to concerts did not inspire my photography. I'm not a concert photographer and I don't photograph, you know, the bands performing. I mean, I have, but it's that's not my forte. What inspired me to become a photographer was my, my father. He was an amateur photographer. He would play around with filters and cameras and he would photograph the eclipses. And I got the photography thing with him, but I also got the guitar thing with him because he's a guitar player, mandolin, violin, but his primary instrument is the guitar. And my parents got divorced when I was 10. And I was always trying to find ways to connect with my dad and communicate with him. And it turned out that photography was one thing. I went to college for photography, much to his chagrin because he thought I'd never make any money as a photographer. Uh, but I did end up going to work for the Eastman Kodak company out of college. I learned photography working for Kodak and testing all different kinds of films. I worked for Kodak Professional. For my first book, 108 Rockstar Guitars, I used all the last films that were ever made for Kodak Professional and then transitioned into digital photography. I was always testing the films and shooting different objects. I always used a macro lens. I love to look at things up close and personal. Kodak sent me to Memphis, Tennessee as one of my territories and I used to go to the Unity Church and there was a church picnic and uh, the guitar player from church asked me out on a date. My father growing up told me I was not allowed to date musicians. I called my dad and I said, listen, dad, I'm calling to confess. I am dating a musician. However, he is the guitar player at church and he owns a vintage guitar store. And my dad said, oh, well, that's different. He's not a touring musician. He, you can date him. And if he ever gets in a Gibson mandolin, I've always wanted one. Let me know. So it wasn't too long after that. He did get in this 1917 Gibson mandolin. And I said, how much? I want to buy that for my dad. And he said, well, you can't afford it. But if you photograph some guitars for me, I have to sell that I don't want to sell. I'll trade you. And so I said, done deal. And that was the first time I photographed a guitar. And I loved it. I loved the smell of them. I loved the way they looked. I, it brought me to my father. I just haven't stopped photographing guitars ever since. I mean, Kodak sent me about six months later after that to New York City as a new territory. And I thought, I'm in New York now. I may as well photograph famous guitars. I beelined it down to the Iridium Room where Les Paul played every Monday night. And my dad used to listen to Les Paul and Mary Ford all the time. I'm like, that's home. I mean, let me start with Les. And Les let me photograph his guitar. And 12 years later, for my first book, he wrote the foreword for it. So it's been a wonderful, incredible journey, I have to say. You, you photographs, I'm sure, hundreds of thousands of, of amazing guitars that have a, a true history. But what was the your favorite guitar that you finally got a chance to photograph after many years of searching for it? Joan Jett's one of those. Mm -hmm. I always admired her, uh, her balls for <laughs> um, being so brave. You know, Susie Quacho really was the front runner of 
of women in rock. She was she was really the first one that broke out as a solo artist, particularly as well. And she wrote the afterword for this book. Um, so I'm so honored to have a woman's voice that was the first woman uh, to break out in rock write my afterword. She's a wonderful woman. However, Joan Jett was very difficult to get access to. And it took me many, many asks, many, many years. And finally, um, over the years, I built a relationship with the with the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame uh, for the number of photo shoots I've done there. And uh, she had one of her guitars from the Runaways there on display. And I contacted them back again and said, listen, I'm going to be at the Rock Hall doing a photo shoot for Rory Gallagher's uh, Stratocaster. Is there any way you can give me approval to photograph that guitar? Because Previously, I'd been asking, can I shoot before a show or, you know, is, can I come to her somehow? And they weren't up for that. But since they didn't have to be involved and it was just at the museum, they said, yeah, go for it. So I'm so pleased that I have Joan Jett and Lita Ford as well, the queen of metal, who was one of the original runaways as well. Joan Jett's cohort. She's also featured in the book. And uh, along with a lot of other women as well, uh, Jennifer Batten, who was with uh, uh, Jeff Beck and Michael Jackson, uh, Susanna Hoffs and Vicki Peterson of the Vangles, Orianthes in this book, Nancy Wilson is in this, uh, Lucinda Williams, uh, just a lot of notable female artists um, as well, St. Vincent. So many. It's hard to remember them all off the top of my head. Well, just flip through your book and go through your table yeah. of contents and figure figure that one out. <laughs> Talk about analog and, and digital photography as well, too, and in that journey. And and I think that's amazing from an artistic perspective, especially photographing these amazing guitars. What has a better feel, in your opinion, from a professional standpoint? Is it the analog or the digital these days? Mm, I love this question. Of course, analog. We all love film, the grain and the color you can get. I'm a Kodaker, so they say once you're a Kodaker, you always bleed yellow and uh, the yellow box. I have a freezer full of film <laughs> that I intend to use at some point. However, what happens is digital has become such an easy workflow. You don't need to use Polaroid to see what you've got as a preview. Uh, you've got your preview right on the back of your camera. Uh, you just plug it in, you upload your your images, you can retouch everything online. Uh, and for, for speed, it's all about the digital. And I've been through the process since the early days of digital. Kodak came out with the first digital camera and I used it and I used it on Slash and Brian May when I photographed their guitars and I got screwed because the original digital cameras were only good for like a high lighting situation. And I was always in low light situations. In those early days, you didn't really know, you know, you just went out there and you, and you tried it. So. I always did take film with me though in those days, so I would also shoot T-Max P3200, a high-speed black and white film, and I would shoot, it was a transparency film t um, called a Color Infrared Film that would actually, Kodak made it for NASA to shoot um, vegetation from space because it would reproduce green chlorophyll plants as red so they could see the vegetation. And I actually photographed Lou Reed's guitar with that film and he loved that because he was a photographer and he loved wacky things. And just a couple weeks before he passed away, his um, representative contacted me and said, hey, Lisa, do you have those files digitized? Because Lou would really love to post them on his uh, Facebook page. And I said, of sure, of course. And I, I didn't know that he was he was not going to be with us much longer. I really didn't know. Sure enough, Lou posted them on his Facebook page and he added the little paragraph about it, NASA shooting vegetation from space on it. And um, he died, like, I think within the week after that. So it was really, really special. But to answer your question, I've got film in the freezer and I will shoot it. And But I'm, I'm digital it, just for, out of necessity. You talked in the book about time limit sometimes you're very strapped for time but what is your optimal time for taking photographs of these amazing guitars all right i love it if i have two hours then i can do things in a nice calm slow pace however i ask for one hour because i don't like to be intrusive i know the crew has got uh, other stuff they have to do to get ready for the show so i try to get in and out and i have a compact system i can carry it all myself and so it takes me 10 minutes to set up my lighting gear and camera and get the guitar out of the rack, photograph it, get it back, 
pack up and out of there. I would love to have more time if, if I can. And sometimes I do get it. If I'm working with the artists at their home, then it's usually pretty chill and you can take longer. Um, one time though, it was photographing Willie Nelson's guitar. I tried for a long, long time to get his guitar. It was hard to get because he always carries Trigger on and off the stage himself. It never leaves his side. And so it was hard to get. And finally he did a private event, William Shatner's annual charity horse show, Hollywood horse show. And so they gave me permission, but there were all these people around. It wasn't like a controlled area. It was, but there were too many people in there. And I was photographing the guitar and this chick comes along with her little cheap Fuji box camera and starts honing in. And, and so they go, okay, okay, we gotta, we gotta finish it. And I, I didn't even get like, I got like 10 f shots and it was film that time, but I managed to get the shots. So it was all right. You know, why is it important to preserve the history of these guitars? for the future generations? Because the future generations need to know the foundation of music in general, not just rock and roll, it's music and the history of music because as we move into the future, it's digital world, isn't it? You know, music is, is digital and we like the analog and guitar is analog and guitars, in my opinion, will always be around um, with the wood situation, um, these vintage guitars that I have been able to capture are so special because the sound will never be the same moving forward with guitars being built on newer woods or, or woods that they're not able to get anymore. That is an important documentation in and of itself is, is capturing the digital, the vintage guitars, but also because the artists that perform on them, their work is so incredible. It's the soundtrack of our lives. And to be able to look at the Jimmy Page double neck that he performs live Stairway to Heaven on, that is a magical guitar. I mean, it's to be able to see it up close and personal and in detail where you can see how his, the way that his hand and his arm move down the center of the pick guard, his pick over the years is etched in a scratch, scratches all the way down the center of the pick art. You would never be able to see that unless you can get up close to the guitar like I have and no one, very few people uh, get that opportunity. Uh, to be able to see Rory Gallagher's Stratocaster and all the wear and tear on that guitar that was stolen from him at one time. And at that time, it, there was hardly anybody could even afford a guitar like that. He was lucky to have one. Someone stole it and it was all over the news. And they ended up finding the guitar in the ditch because somebody just ditched it because they knew they, they would never be able to sell it or, or have it. And he got it back and, and it has scratches on it from that even too. And so that's like, that's the history of music and of those artists to be able to look at Keith Richards guitar and all the wear and tear on that guitar. You see artists, photographers to photograph the artists and they photograph them with their guitars. They photograph them performing with their guitars. And my view is that's already been done. I didn't want to redo that. I wanted to capture the guitar as the art, as the subject that personifies the artist by what they leave behind on the guitar, how they personalize it, how they perform with it. You can see the sweat, the blood, you know, the blood, sweat, blood and tears on the guitar, the buckle rash on the back or what stickers or, you know, like uh, James Hetfield's guitar, his Flying V that he used on the Kill em All album is in this guitar. It was his very, one of his very first guitars. He couldn't afford a Flying V. So he got a Japanese knockoff and he's, he etched all over it art and on the back, he's flipping a bird and he's got a skull and crossbones on the neck, on the headstock that was broken and he glued it back and all the glue is yellowed over the years. And it, it's just an incredible piece and the truss rod cover eventually fell off and the guitar tech put on a Gibson one so it looks like a real Gibson guitar. This is history. This is, um, you know, the, the youth culture today, they listen to Metallica. And if they didn't see this guitar in the book, they may never see it because he doesn't take it out on the road. You know, he's playing ESP Snake Bite now and that's also featured in the book as well. So I, I captured like old school and then new school, what they're playing. And of course the ESP guitars are all, you know, super high tech guitars now. And this is all tricked out custom for him to his specifications.
Jimmy Page, Hendrix, I mean, Kurt Cobain's guitar, like uh, Joan Jett. You have such a, a wide history. Of, I mean, going back to Elvis, even for that matter, and B.B. King and great legends along that line. When you finally got a chance to, to photograph any of the guitars in your career, what one brought a tear to your eye? Oh, boy. Um, you know, you mentioned B.B. King, and I, I met him. Uh, I was trying to photograph his guitar, and my girlfriend actually knew one of his tour managers. He was doing a B.B. King uh, Blues Festival in Las Vegas, and so she was able to introduce me to the tour manager, and we all got backstage, got to meet B.B., and they had a guitar there that he had signed that he was giving away, but he hadn't really played it, but they let me photograph it. And so it was nice that I got that and I got to meet B.B. The same friend that knew the tour manager, it turned out that B.B. lived in her neighborhood. She would take him a cherry pie every now and then. She'd go over to his house and she'd knock on the door and his daughter, Patty, would always answer the door. Patty would take care of B.B. when he was in town, cook for him and, you know, get him in his bath and stuff like that. And so she eventually introduced me to Patty and Patty and I became good friends. So one night... Uh, she said, listen, Lisa, I, I want you to come over and meet my meet my dad again and you can spend some real quality time with him. I said, OK. And so one night it was a Sunday night. She called me at 8 p.m. at night and I had one of those headaches. It was like a migraine headache. I was in my pajamas and she said, hey, baby, daddy's in the bathtub right now and he wants you to come over and he's really looking forward to meeting you. I said, oh, Patty, I am so sick right now. I have got this terrible headache and I'm in my pajamas and it's Sunday night and I'm I'm so sorry. I just I just can't come tonight. Can we make it another time? And she's like, Oh, okay, no problem. We'll we'll do it another time. Well, right after that, he that's when he started going in and out of the hospital with pneumonia and he um, he didn't make it. That was the end. And so I never got to go over to his house and spend time with him. But she eventually brought his guitars over to my house and I photographed them. And these were uh, very special guitars to him. One of them was uh, the guitar that he was playing uh, currently at that time. And the other one was Lucille uh, with diamonds mm -hmm. and that Gibson had made for him and gifted to him. It has two diamonds in the headstock and the eyes for Gibson and um, for Lucille, L-U-C-I-L-L-E. Um, and so I photographed those and they're on my sofa in my house. And it, they're such treasures. They're such jewels. And, and Patty is, is such a wonderful woman and, and we're, we're soul sisters. So very sentimental. I do greatly appreciate your time here. Uh, thank you so much for this conversation. There's so much more we could talk about, so much more we could do. And I usually have four questions I ask at the end, but we won't be able to get to those, unfortunately. If your life was a movie or a comic book or a, a TV series, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? What would its soundtrack be? It would be probably um, uh, ACDC. Uh, what do you do for money, honey? <laughs> and the caricature would probably be me holding a guitar. I love it. A whole lot of Rosie. <laughs> with a whole lot of Rosie. Something like that. So then where can we find you? How can we support you? And of course, where can we find Immortal Axes, Guitars That Rock, and your other works as well? Well, Amazon is really the best outlet. You can always get it on Amazon. Just doing this campaign in Canada right now, they're getting it into the bookstores. So pretty soon for the holiday season, it should be in all the bookstores, but Amazon's really the, a great go-to. And if anyone does want a signed book, all you have to do is go to my Instagram and send me a direct message and say, hey, I got your book. I would love for you to send me a signature book plate and I will sign it to you and mail it to you with a guitar pick in it. So my social media is at LSJ Rock Photos and you can follow me there on Instagram and send me a private message if you'd like a signed book plate. Wonderful. Thank you so much for this, Lisa. I do greatly appreciate it. And that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word two, not the number two. On our YouTube channel, which is a lot more updated than our website, which is youtube.com forward slash C forward slash TGT Media. 
And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.